Tilson home, part of the fourth generation of the Tilson family. And um, just so thrilled that you guys are gonna join us today on our Facebook Live. We are going to talk about energy efficiency and what that means, what it means to you. You can always interact. We'll be answering questions live as we go about this thing. Don Dantzler is moderating for us once again. Say hi, Don. Hi, everybody. All right, thank you, Don. She's our director of marketing for Tilson Homes. And um, I don't think I've talked to, we will do one day we will, but I've been knowing Don for uh, close to 15 years now. Um, so she, she has done all the amazing things that you see on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, Instagram. Um, website. She and her team are wholly responsible for that. So uh, we truly couldn't do it without her. So thank you, Don, for handling it. Oh, thank you. It's a um, lot of fun. I enjoy doing it. Yeah, well, it, it is a lot of fun. And so anyway, if you have questions going along, uh, type your questions in. I'll answer as, as many as I can. Um, but we are going to go ahead and proceed with talking about energy efficiency in your Tilson home. So, um, what is it? What is it all about? What does it mean? Well, it starts. We got to have some type of way to measure all of this energy efficiency. So, how do we go about doing that? Well, the the most broadly accepted way today is the HERS index, and we sometimes say at Tilson Homes it's all about HERS, and uh, what that stands for is Home Energy Rating System. You can take it however you want to, but uh, HERS score is a is a really big deal. It takes into account a lot of different things. So you've got your roofing and your ductwork and how the attic seals up and your insulation, how tight the house is, what type of HVAC you're using, how you're going to heat the water, what type of windows you're using, what type of thermostats, what type of lighting, all the appliances. And all those things are kind of poured into a, a big calculation. And this uh, software spits out a HERS score, a HERS score. And we do one before we ever start construction. Um, and then, of course, we get one that's ultimately um, done after after the home is actually built, but um, Energy Star uses hers ratings. The uh, we have found that the VA or in Texas Vet use hers ratings. So the ratings would be like it, it's like a golf score. The lower, the better. Uh, so like the zero would be a net zero energy. Like you're not you're not using any energy whatsoever, which is almost unattainable. Not unattainable, but conventionally building it's not attainable. And then like. An existing home on the resale market, maybe built in the, you know, 90s, 80s, 90s, like that, that it would be in excess of 150. Um, we're, we're really trying to shoot sub 70 all the time, um, very much like golf. So we're, we're trying to get down in there in that uh, 50 to 65 number if we can, uh, but the lower the better. And that's what a HERS rating is. Every house is scored on a HERS rating. So, um, so what really makes a home energy efficient and, and, and trying to do this in a way without in the most judicious way possible as you spend your money. So it doesn't necessarily mean throw out, you know, throw the biggest HVAC you can at it, the highest sear rating, the most insulation you could pack in. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, what it really means is how do you make a house tight? How do you keep water out? How do you keep air from infiltrating in and out? And how do you keep heat from transferring? In this part of the world where we build predominantly, we're more concerned with heat being able to, to penetrate into the building, into the home than we are with the cold. You know, maybe if you're up in Wyoming or Michigan or Montana, someplace like that, uh, you, you're really concerned about the cold where it gets to be sub, sub freezing for long periods of time. Uh, where well, we're building homes, that's not really what we're too terribly concerned about. But starting off, we got to manage water. And that is a thing uh, where we build, even in the Texas Hill Country, all the way, obviously, to the, to the Gulf Coast, to the Gulf of Mexico. Managing water. How do we control moisture? How do we, uh, what do we do about vapor issues, about humidity that builds up? So this is a really big part of energy efficiency. It's about using your money in a really smart way. So we got to protect, you know, water can damage a lot of things um, fairly quickly. And, and so we want to do what we can to protect the things from water. And in some cases, we're deliberately putting water inside the home. So like your faucets and your showers and your commodes. So how do we make sure that that water gets safely out of the home without, without damaging anything? So there's a lot of science that goes on to managing the water, um, reducing your risk of mold, of course, reducing your risk of indoor air quality. Uh, those are all things taken into consideration when we're talking about managing water. 
So how do we do it? Well, we start with the outside, of course. Um, you want to make sure that we 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 want to make sure that we establish positive drainage away from the home, all the way around it. Uh, so that it really, really simply, so water runs away from the house, so gravity draws it away. So that takes into you know your your garages, your driveways, your porches, your sidewalks, all of that is designed to slope and carry water away from the building. You don't want water standing on any one side of your home for any long period of time because it, it will the soil will react differently where it's wet than it does where it's dry. And, and we want to mitigate that as much as we possibly can. And one of those ways is make sure that it goes away. Now, what about the water? What about the moisture that's in the ground under the house? Well, that's a little tougher to control. That's why we do that uh, geotechnical investigation before we ever start your home. That's where we design the foundation. We do that bearing in mind how that soil reacts to moisture, but specifically for energy efficiency, we want to make sure that moisture can't come up from the ground through the slab. You see, concrete is actually porous. It, uh, it's like a big hard sponge and, it, and water can permeate uh, back and forth through it slowly, of course, nothing, nothing like sand, but, but it's not water resistant either. I mean, it's not waterproof. So we do put a waterproof barrier beneath the concrete. You see this, this picture here where the guys are out there working this concrete. The concrete's there towards the back on the other side of that one before. And then you can see this kind of black polyethylene plastic that's there. And we've got some different blog posts about that you can read about. But suffice it to say that that um, black polyethylene plastic prevents moisture that's in the ground, in the dirt, beneath the foundation from transferring up into the home itself. When in it can, it can delaminate floors, it can uh, make weird kind of stains on, on, um, on flooring and of course, make your cabinets uh, shrink and swell. So you want to really be sure that this is done properly. Um, and again, this is truly beginning with the ground up on energy efficiency. Another way to keep moisture out, keep water out before the shingles ever go on, you know, what kind of liner are we using and how is that liner applied? How is it done in the valleys and um, all the various areas like that to, to make sure that that water is able to stay out. So the way these are flashed in these valleys and things that we're talking about valleys where two planes come together, P-L-A-N-E-S, not uh, uh, rectangular, rectangular surfaces. Make sure that we're shedding water. If you've got any questions at all, go ahead and feel free to ask them. Uh, I'm going to finish up on the waterproofing and then we'll stop at the waterproofing portion and answer some questions. Does that sound okay, Don? I'll take that. Yep, sounds yes. good. Sounds good. Okay. Um, and wall assemblies as well. Um, so we want to be sure we keep moisture out from getting in through the wall. You know, rain, as it's, as it's raining down, it doesn't just rain on the roof of your home. Um, water is going to hit the side of the home. Water is going to splash up uh, from the ground, either from your landscaping or from, from rocks or from um, just the mud itself. So um, an, an old saying of uh, water does what's called wicking. And, and a way to think about that is water runs, water always goes downhill unless it doesn't. Um, and if you so understand what I'm talking about, if you were to take a piece of paper and, and, and find a water puddle and set the piece of paper in the water puddle, what's going to happen to that water? The, you're going to actually see the moisture start to go up um, into that, into the water. So into the paper rather. So we want to be sure that we are doing something to mitigate moisture. We use a Tyvek, uh, Tyvek drain wrap to accomplish that. And that, and we have to, we tape it. So all this blue tape that you're seeing on the sides, there's a uh, flexible tape that goes in before the windows are installed. Um, the way that it's done over the flashing, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we have to do in a very specific order to make sure that when water starts to hit this house, when the elements start to hit it, water stays outside of the building envelope. We don't want water um, getting to it. I do have a little, a little prop here. Some are more user-friendly than others, but this is kind of your, your OSB that will be going around, uh, all the way around the house. And then this is that Tyvek drain wrap. And you can see that it's gonna wrap around the corners and it's, it's kind of rigid. And then as moisture builds up in the wall, um, so your brick would be out here about an inch, inch and a half or so, or so. And as moisture builds up, it's gonna come down this surface and then out the weep holes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That is next. So the weep hole. So the, if you ever see these things on your house, existing home or new home, you don't ever want to cover these up. 
you want to make sure that that because what these are doing these allow the moisture that builds up just like a, a glass of iced tea or if this bottle of water were super super cold and it were warm inside my office moisture is going to beat up on this and run down your house does the exact same thing when it's uh, 100 degrees outside in texas and you keep it on 74 or 76 inside your home the exact same thing is happening that moisture is going to build up on the outside which is totally fine as long as it does it on this membrane on this tyvek and then it's gravity is going to pull it down and come out these weep holes also as rain may be hitting uh, this brick is brick and stone is also porous so water can can get in you want to be able to be sure that we give that water a way to get out um, so don't ever cover these up and um, if you're worried about bugs maybe spray in there or something like that but don't don't ever cover these up because uh, that's how your house gets rid of the moisture that's building up in the walls really really important windows and doors um, and again ask your questions now we're going to stop here in just a second after uh, our water concentration and, and answer some questions but Suffice it to say that we're doing many, many, many different things all around the various windows, doors. Every penetration into the into the, the building envelope has to be completely sealed up, particularly large surfaces that can that can get attacked by wind driven rain or um, any kind of moisture that could be coming in. So we love windows. They're beautiful. But some time and attention has to be paid to how do we make sure moisture can't get in around where those windows are attached. So you're, they're siliconed in place. They got tape going around them, tape on the inside before they ever go on. So there's this this doesn't happen kind of accidentally. You need to be have an expert putting this stuff together. And then everywhere there's any kind of penetration coming out. So where your gas meter, for instance, is going to hook up, you want to be sure that's good and taped off with a flexible tape. Uh, where your dryer vent is going to go out, that's what you're seeing there in the top right corner. You want to be sure that it's got mastic or some type of material around it that will, again, prevent air, moisture, anything from, from getting in and out. Um, a lot of time and attention is paid. This is a uh, down here. You'll see a stone or brick ledge. That's the, the concrete itself is actually wider here where the stone or brick is going to be. And that stone or brick will stack up here and then the moisture will run down out this polyethylene plastic and then out your weep hole. So then. One of the final things we do as we're putting the house together up top is any kind of gables where you have brick or hardy plank up above a roof, you want to be sure you have some type of a kick out flashing. So as water is coming down this surface, that it doesn't just run over the side because it can eventually eat away and get inside there. You want to have it literally kick out. So the water will come down and then kind of come over the side a little bit. It looks kind of weird when you see it, uh, but this is actually done properly. You want to be sure the water is diverted away from your stone, your brick, your hardy, your stucco, anything that's up there that can, that can retain that water. So, Don, we'll stop there. Do we have any questions yet? We do have a couple of questions. All right, fire away. Pop those up. Carlos is wondering when building a home from one of our existing plans, can he adjust the square footage to make it more affordable? Okay, so when uh, building a home from one of our existing plans, can we adjust the footage of the home to make it more affordable in different aspects? Um, yes, you can. It, uh, what I have found in my, in my experience is that starting with a larger home and trying to go down is not typically the best way to achieve affordability. You're actually better off starting with probably a house that's a little smaller than what you had in mind and, and adding two. Um, and, and simply because a lot of the aspects of the bigger homes, you know, the, the footage itself isn't really what makes it all that much more expensive. It's sometimes ceiling treatments, details, things like that, that you're still going to want. The kitchen, for instance, the way that looks, maybe the way that the cathedral ceiling goes out on that family room, you know, making making a bedroom two feet smaller is not going to make that big cathedral ceiling in the family room cost any less, if, if that kind of makes sense. So uh, my recommendation is to start with a house that maybe is a little smaller, a little under your budget that you would have ordinarily gone with and then add the things you really like, uh, maybe uh, of one of those larger plans to that smaller house and just see where you come out. And our consultants can do that both ways. You know, we'll, we'll show you side by side. Hey, here's X, Y, Z plan taking this out of it. Here's what the bottom line number is. And here's, you know, PDQ plan with these things added to it. And here's the bottom line numbers and let you just choose. But that's a great question. Thanks, Carla. Okay. Great. What else? 
So John is asking on his property, there is a floodway in the very back. Is there any way if he brings the survey to the appointment, can we verify exactly where the house will sit to make sure that we're out of the way of that floodway? Okay. Um, the question is, can, is, is there a way that if we bring the survey to an appointment, can we verify exactly where the house sits as not to be too close to the floodway? The answer to that question is the only person in Texas actually that's licensed to be able to do that is a registered professional land surveyor. Now, that does not mean you should not bring that with you to deployment and we can get really, really, really close. But the question said exactly, and the answer is we're not licensed to, to do it exactly. However, we have a whole lot of experience with building houses uh, at or near the floodway or floodplains. And there's also some different, you said floodway, that, that means one thing um, in, FEMA, in FEMA world, floodplain means another thing in FEMA world, and they're gonna have a little bit different rules that apply to them. What will ultimately happen is we will locate uh, one of two things, and it doesn't really matter which order it happens in, but a, a surveyor, an RPLS, a registered professional land surveyor, is gonna, if, if a floodway or floodplain is in fact on your property, they're gonna have to set what's called a benchmark and a natural ground elevation, which is a big fancy word for, they're gonna find, they're gonna, they'll find out from FEMA what the actual floodplain is, what the number, and it's usually measured in feet above sea level. Uh, so let's say on your property, it's it's uh, they found the floodplain to be at, at 99 feet base flood elevation, BFE. So at 99 feet, and they're saying at, at 99 feet, everything below that number is in the floodplain. Everything above that is out of the floodplain. They, they, FEMA picks a spot that they say statistically, you won't flood. So what a surveyor is going to do is go out to your property, and they're going to set a benchmark or find one that exists already, or they're going to set a new one in a tree, in a telephone pole, um, on a road, on the top of a gutter, something. It'll be a, it'll have their RPLS number, and it'll, it's a spike or a nail or something, a, a benchmark, something we can go find that we can use our laser levels to shoot where we're going to be, and that will tell us exactly. So if that's already been done, yes, we can come out to your site and make sure that we will have to, to uh, where exactly we are above that base flow elevation. Uh, counties and cities, um, and really mortgage companies for that matter, because insurance won't let you build a home in the floodplain. So rest assured that before we ever drive a nail on your property, we're going to know we're, we're a foot, a foot and a half, two feet, whatever we are above base flood elevation. But uh, benchmark with a natural ground elevation is going to have to happen. So you can get working on that, or one of our consultants can help you get working on that. Great question, John. All okay, right, we're going to move on about managing air. We are. All right, y'all keep your questions coming. We'll answer them live as we go. Again, thank you for joining us. Um, so we talked about managing water, part of the energy efficiency. The next one is managing air. You know, we're spending a bunch of money on uh, cooling our air for the most part here in, in Southeast Texas, um, and even in all, even North Texas where we build, all of Texas really. We, we, we run our AC systems here. Um, so what can we do to make sure that we're maximizing our dollars uh, on our on that money we're spending on our AC system. Well, we do some tests throughout construction. Usually these are done towards, towards the end of construction, but we're designed all this way. And the first one is a duct blaster test, which basically means we're gonna cover the uh, return airs, we're gonna hook a fan up to all of our HVAC duct work, and we're gonna turn that joker on. And our goal is less than 4% leakage. The code allows for more than that. Uh, but our goal is 4% or less. That way we know we are exceeding the code. In other words, you've, you've heard duct tape. That's that's the tape word all taped together. Um, we want to be sure that we're not losing the air that, that we're cooling uh, through the ductwork. So that's one test that we do to verify that. And actually, a third party does that. Another one is on the whole house itself. That's the blower door test. And in climate zone two, uh, which is the kind of the southeastern part of the state. We're allowed five air changes per hour, so we got to beat that. And again, this is kind of the golf score thing, the lower the better. And in North Texas, uh, it's three air changes per hour or less. So they hook up this big tent looking thing to one of your exterior doors, turn this fan on and start sucking air out of the house. And it's going to tell us if we maybe didn't tape something up properly or didn't caulk something properly or starts pulling air from everywhere underneath the uh, toe plates, uh, uh, around the windows, around doors, from the attic, from light fixtures, from air registers, from ceiling fans, and it will and it will tell us where the house is leaking, and then if we have to fix anything, where we need to fix it. So, testing really important. 
Um, insulation, the air changes per hour. Again, I kind of drew the line there, but you can see it doesn't, this is drawn by the, the government. So it's, it's not exactly, well, there's some logic to it, I'm sure, but this is the, this is the edict that's been put down. But basically this is climate zone two down here. We're doing R15 bats in the walls, R38 in the attic. Um, we have to achieve five air changes per hour or less. Up here in the yellow on your screen is counties where we're gonna be doing spray foam standard. It's not required, it's just what we do standard. Um, and this is, so you're gonna have open cell spray foam insulation that helps, up achieve, helps us achieve that three air changes per hour or less. Now, when we make a house real tight, that's great and all, cause we're not losing all that air we're cooling. So that's a wonderful thing. But how do we make sure that we're getting fresh air into the home. We don't want to be breathing the same stale air over and over again. Well, we have to give the house a set of lungs, uh, a way to bring fresh air into the house. So that's, you'll see in the soffit of some of our models. And of course, if you're building a home with us, you'll definitely see these. Um, this is our fresh air intake and a damper. A damper is just a fancy word for a flap. Uh, so this will be a flap and a piece of duct work that when it's, when the thermostat tells the fresh air intake, hey, I need fresh air, we're breathing the same stale air, it'll open the damper. So this would flip up here to open and it will allow fresh air from the outside to be brought in. And then when it's allowed enough in, the damper will close automatically. And so that we're not getting that air coming in from the outside. So we bring fresh air into the home to make sure that, that uh, your indoor air quality remains excellent. And then filtration. How do we filter that air? Um, I know you've probably in the past seen the, and you still still, the little one inch thick uh, filters. We, we use um, these big old things, okay? It's a, it's a whole house filtration system. This one happens to be a 20 inch by 25 inch by four inch thick. Um, they last, a lot of times ask how long they last. Uh, a, a, a very loose rule of thumb is one month per inch. So in this case, it's about four months, three, four months. Depends on the uh, time of year as well. So obviously in the summertime, your air handler is gonna be working a lot more than it is perhaps in the, in the winter time. So maybe in the summer months, you go three months um, and maybe in the winter time, maybe five, six months before you have to change these out. But um, a, a good handy tip is to also date them on one end. Uh, we do that when we install them. That way you kind of know when that's done. But this is really easy, easy to access right up in the disappearing stairway. It's, it's usually within arm's reach, in fact, uh, not even having to get up into the attic. So that's the only one you need. You don't need to put, in fact, you'll see in our, a lot of our model homes and in your home, the return air vents, which are still in the ceiling, like your hallways in every room, they're actually screwed to the ceiling. They don't have the latches that release. So you don't put filters in those anymore in our homes. Um, we also want to figure out a way to get, you know, bad air out of the house. So the grease from, from when you're cooking, we have um, your, your vented hoods, whether it's a microwave vented hood or a um, over the range vented hood. We want to be, that vent does run all the way out of the attic, not into the attic. It goes up through the attic and then out the roof. That air has to get all the way out. Um, so we want to do that bathroom, same thing with bathroom and utility room vents, the exhaust fans we use in there, they vent and they go all the way out of the home. You want all that moisture that's built up and do run. If you're taking a shower or, or running hot water, taking a hot bath, something like that, you really should turn these things on. Cause again, the houses are built super, super tight now. So, um, you want to be sure you have a way to get that moisture out of the house. It's not going to, it's not going to just leak out on its own. It needs to need some assistance. And then again, we're gonna seal these up where they go to the outside. And that's what you kind of, sometimes you'll see some messy stuff. Um, maybe in, looks like, it looks like a sloppy kind of foam mess, but it's, it's sealing up the, um, the exterior here. So right in there. And then duct work, same thing, your HVAC duct work, you want all that sealed up. You want uh, efficient, basically the, the least number of bins as possible. You don't want to make a bunch of 90 degree turns with your, uh, with your duct work because that makes your AC have to work harder to push, push that air. We don't want our ACs having to work any harder than they already do. At Tilson, we do things a little different on our return air strategy. I know you've probably been sitting in a room before, maybe in an older house and the AC kicks on and the door kind of slams shut on the room that you're sitting in, or you can hear it kind of whistling underneath the door. Um, 
to prevent that, we use actually a return air in every room that, that has a door on it. We're going to put a return air in there. That way you're getting even distribution of pressure around the house and it helps regulate the temperature throughout the home because the air from every single room is being sucked back up into the AC system and then redistributed out. So you get a much better mix of uh, air quality, uh, moisture content in the air, and the temperature remains more consistent. And you don't have those weird kind of whistling or hums um, if you have the door shut. So it's okay to shut the doors in, in your Tilson home um, and, and have the AC on. A lot of houses, it, it actually puts a strain on the AC system to have the doors shut. All right, so we'll stop here. Dawn, do we have any questions again at this point? About we that? do have some questions. Let me Our get way. those up. So Maria is asking, is it less expensive to build a two-story versus a one-story? Um, well, the answer, the answer, Maria, okay, is it less expensive to build a two-story than a one-story? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, there's no definitive answer. I, I would say, broadly speaking, yes. So, so for instance, if, if if it's a true two-story, so let's just take 2,000 square feet of living area as an example. Um, a true two-story would be 1,000 square feet down and 1,000 square feet identical to it right on top of it. So in, in that situation, that's probably going to be less expensive because you only have 1,000 square feet of slab and 1,000 square feet of roof. Um, however, we don't see a whole lot of two-story plans exactly like that anymore. We usually see like you know, let's say 2,000, 1,500 or so, 1,600 square feet down and maybe four or 500 up. Um, and in a case like that, I, I'm not, you know, it's not going to be that much less expensive. It may be some, but not not enough to really make the decision, okay, we definitely need that. But in a, in a true form of 2,000, 1,000, 1,000, or 1,500, 1,500 for 3,000 square foot, theoretically, that would be cheaper. Now, if you have your downstairs, you're going to have 14 foot ceilings and you know, fireplaces in every room and all that kind of stuff, then that all that goes out the window. Um, but but broadly speaking, you could say yes. Um, if you're doing that. What else do we got, Don? What other okay. questions do we have? Um, John has another question about his property. Uh, apparently yeah. there's a, a slope towards the rear of the property and he's wondering about putting in a pad um, so that he's not messing his budget up, you know, blowing the budget on ground prep. All right, so property has a decent slope towards the rear, and can a large level pad be built to set the home on without blowing the budget on ground prep? Uh, well, John, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how deep the slope is, and I don't know what the budget is for the, that you had in mind for the home or for the ground prep. But, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's a foot or two, it's, it's probably not a big deal, uh, even up to four feet probably. If it's eight or 10 or 12 feet, um, it's going to cost a significant amount of money, you know, uh, without knowing exactly what the fall is. Um, it, it's hard to say the answer is it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, you know, it's not, the slope is not going to change. Um, whether you build with us or with Joe's homes or, you know, whatever it, the, the slope kind of is what it is, as they say, and there will probably be different ways to tackle it. And that's what I would recommend is that, Hey, kind of what are my options? You know, what if we did it with just slab over the footprint of the home? Could we, what, what's the price to do it that way versus the price to build an entire pad for the, because in some cases it's actually less expensive for us to deal with those situations with just concrete, you know, building up two, three feet of concrete on the, on the low side, on the back side of the home, let's say, than it is to build a, you know, 80 foot by 120 foot pad that maybe eight feet out of level, because it's going to have, the pad's going to have to be, 10 or 15 feet bigger than the house all the way around. So um, it's not always cheaper to do it with a dirt pad. Um, in some cases it's more expensive. So the answer is probably to come out there uh, with uh, whatever house you have in mind and let us shoot some grades. Um, so we have accurate numbers to work with and then we can get some accurate bids. That way we don't have to wonder. That's the way we would handle it. What other questions? Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Chris has a question about zoned AC systems. Okay. Are zoned AC systems more reliable and cost effective to manage throughout a home, manage temperature throughout a home? Great question, Chris. What I would say is um, it depends on the layout of the home and the size of the home. So it's not, zoning it's not typically done from an energy efficiency standpoint. Zoning it is oftentimes done from a comfort level standpoint. So for instance, let's say that you're empty nesters 
and you're building maybe a 2,000 or 2,200 square foot home that really only needs, I mean, truly only needs one AC system. It, it's cost prohibitive to do it with two. That's overkill. Um, so you'd be spending money you would never make back. So you're going to do it with one system. But let's say somebody's like, yeah, but you know, we, we want to keep our side of the house at a comfortable 74, 76, but nobody's really in the other side of the house for, you know, 10 months out of the year. We'd like to let that run up to 82, 84. In a case like that, zoning the home might make sense. And all a zone is, is kind of go back to that damper example, it's still one condensing unit, one AC system, one air handler. So it's just one unit, but it has a damper in there, electronic damper, just like the fresh air intake does and two thermostats. So it'll have a thermostat over on, um, let's say the master suite side of the home, and then another thermostat maybe over in the spare bedroom hallway. And let's say the spare bedroom is set to 82 and the master is set to 74 in our example. What will happen in the zone system is all the air in the house, the, the AC is, is cooling the entire home um, until this side of the home over here hits 82 degrees. And when that thermostat reads 82, boom, that damper is going to close on that side of the home and send all of the air over to the master suite side. Okay. And so, and it'll keep doing that until it hits. So that's what a, a zoning does. Um, we, we see them employed from time to time. Um, it's not, it's not a really a more energy efficient necessarily. It's more of a, a comfort level and a usability standpoint, but that's a great, great question. Uh, it is an excellent way to manage temperature from that perspective. Uh, there's really not a, a more cost-effective way to do it. It's probably the most cost-effective way to do that. Certainly less than having like a two-ton unit over here and a two-ton unit over here. Because then you got double everything. You got two condensing units, two air handlers, you know, twice as many things that could go wrong over the life of the home. So um, anytime we can minimize that, that's a good thing in our opinion. Thanks, Chris. Great question. What okay. other questions might we have? Our friend Joe is back with fighting words again. I see. He's um, back. He's back. The Crimson he's got Tide questions about HVAC systems okay. and a roll tide for me. All right. On HVAC systems, do you prefer or recommend all electric versus gas heat? Is natural gas available or propane? Roll tide. All right. So uh, the answer is depends on where you're building. Uh, so the, the land that you'd be looking at, that would ultimately determine if you have natural gas or propane available. Um, if there is no natural gas available, propane is pretty much your only option if you want to have gas. Currently, I would say uh, HVAC systems that we use with a heat pump uh, that we do standard across the state, you, it's pretty doggone efficient to, for it to be all electric. Um, and then the next kind of the next level from that would be all electric with maybe a gas backup, gas emergency heat. And if I remember right, you're going to maybe build up in the Hunt County area in North Texas. So you know, maybe it'd be a better deal to do up there uh, if you can get But propane. Um, you know, you're going to have to buy, obviously, or lease some type of a propane tank. So you got to think about what that might look like uh, in your landscape design. There are also many, many subdivisions. In fact, we built a home for my brother up there um, north of McKinney, right there in Melissa, um, across from our office. And the subdivision where he built actually required that the propane tank be buried which is not uncommon, but it is something to consider. Okay, now we got to put this tank in the ground. You got to be able to access it so you can refill it. Um, is there a strategic time of year to buy propane? Yes, there is. I would recommend the summer. Um, I would not recommend buying propane in February in North Texas. You're going to pay a premium because there's, there's a higher demand on it. So um, it, it, it would depend, but but all electric, you're pretty safe um, and, and very efficient, particularly with a heat pump that we use, but we install um, gas furnaces and gas water heaters as well. So um, it, it would, I would I would price out maybe what uh, natural gas costs per, per cubic foot where you're thinking about building or what propane costs are and, and then go from there. But um, yeah, you, you're, either way is, is really fine. Great question. Thanks, Joe. We're going to move on to managing heat. We are. All right. So we definitely want to keep heat out of our house. We're spending a lot of money cooling them. So what do we do to keep them from getting attacked? Well, we start with doors and windows. Um, so the sun is attacking those things just like it's attacking the rest of the home. There's all these kind of little numbers you're going to see on uh, windows on the stickers. So you got a solar heat gain coefficient, you got a U factor, and these are just, these are numbers and they do mean something. They, they, they mean uh, how well does this piece of glass perform? You know, I mean, ideally the most energy efficient home on earth would be 
um, solid on all four sides and the top. There'd be no windows, no doors, no nothing. Um, I don't think it would sell very well, but that would be super, super efficient. You wouldn't have any sunshine getting in, heating things up. Um, so we use a double pane vinyl, tilt sash, low E glazing, and um, with a very good U-factor and solar heat gain coefficient. So, you know, it, it's just, it's these are all, and by the way, these all go into the calculation of that HERS score. Um, thermal bridging is, in, 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 this sounds like a real, I was thinking about this last night, Don, how to, how to explain thermal bridging, and I think I got it. I, I hope this lands with folks. All right, let's go. If it's, a, if it's 100 degrees outside in Fort Worth, Texas, okay, August, Fort Worth, it's hot. And I put two pieces of pipe outside in the sun for like four hours. One is a piece of just white PVC pipe, and one is black metal, like black gas piping. And I told you, go grab one of them and hold on to it for 10 minutes. Which one might you go grab? I am going for the white one. I'm going for the plastic, right? Why, why yes. might that be? Because it's not going to absorb all that heat. It's not going to absorb heat as well. Yeah, so that's what thermal bridging is, is what can we do to, to make our houses very poor conductors of hot and cold? Um, the, so the, the, the better thermal bridge something is, then um, against, then, then the better insulator really is. So that's why vinyl, for instance, is a, we prefer vinyl windows over aluminum windows, let's say, uh, because vinyl is a poor conductor of hot and cold versus aluminum, so, and, and which means it's going to insulate better. So these are steps that we take from the framing standpoint, from the materials that we use standpoint of how to keep heat from fighting to get inside of our home. So what you're kind of looking at here, this is what's known as a California corner, so so back way back when we were framing houses we would run this wall all the way to this exterior wall this is two exterior walls meeting together you can tell because they're both pressure treated toe plates coming to an exterior corner and we've wrapped the exterior corner with polyethylene plastic we've left a gap here we've turned a two by four sideways we've done that so that we can get insulation back behind this area here same thing with this intersection this is a what this probably is is a closet quite frankly um, and we've left what this is called a ladder T. So T simply means an intersection of T, not, not uh, anything else. So what we can do is we can get insulation back behind there, whether it's spray foam, spray foam or fiberglass, doesn't matter, but a way to get insulation back there. Um, so use the amount of wood that's needed. You, you can overbuild something, you can over-engineer something, and you're, you might be better off filling cavities with insulation as opposed to wood, because wood is not a great insulator. It's better than metal, uh, but it's not as good as, as um, fiberglass or spray foam insulation. So these are all different kind of ways that we reduce thermal bridging. You know, so again, back way back when we would when we were building a header, this would be a piece of plot, half inch plywood um, to get the width of, of the header of this window or a door on an exterior wall. Well, now we're using a piece of like R3 um, foam so that, again, that that heat is stopped when it's on its way through to try and get into the home when the sun's beating down on this thing in July or August, it's going to get stopped better here than it would be against a piece of plywood. That's what we're doing. It would reduce thermal bridging air sealing. You know, again, these are all about ways to fight air or heat trying to get inside of our homes. Again, ask questions. If you guys want to, we'll be answering questions live as we go. Uh, we seal every penetration. So all the sheetrock, all the recess, every light fixture that's, against the ceiling, uh, we fill that in. We, all the sill plates, so the, the first board that lays down on the concrete, attic stairs, windows, doors, all of it is sealed up. So this is um, the sill plate, or what's known as sill seal. So it's a membrane, basically, that, that goes down. Before we even put the first piece of lumber down, this is gonna go on the concrete, and then it forms a gasket when we put that exterior wall, that toe plate down keeps air, again, from, from being pulled up underneath uh, trying to get in. So air is always fighting to try and get inside your house, particularly every time your AC kicks on, because what does it do? It sucks air from everywhere. And so it's trying to suck air from wherever it can to get it up into the return air. So all we're trying to do is make it where it can't get it from the outside. As we're building your home, you may see some, what looks like really funky looking uh, foam in place. It looks kind of messy, but this is a good thing. This is uh 
again, air, when that AC system kicks on, it starts pulling air. The AC compressors are very strong. And when they start pulling, they'll pull it from wherever they can get it. And that could mean in a wall outlet. Okay, and that's what this is sealing up. All you're, you're sealing up where the water piping goes through, where the PVC vents go through, where the um, electrical outlets go through. And anywhere that air can get up and up into the attic, we're going to seal it up real tight. This is a recessed light fixture. We're going to caulk around um, everything, all around the disappearing stairway, all around your electrical outlets. Uh, we use a, a very high-end attic stairway in climate zone two. We don't have to do this in climate zone three because we're we're uh, doing spray foam. We'll get to that in a minute. But we use a, a large 30-inch um, by 54-inch, 375-pound rated aluminum ladder. And you can, it's hard to tell it in here, but there's this is a very thick, about a two-inch thick door. It really seals up like an exterior door. It's weather stripped, has an R10 uh, foam inside it that keeps air from penetrating up inside there. Uh, again, in climate zone two, we're going to be using a radiant barrier decking. This blocks 97% of the sun's radiant heat. There's various brands. This happens to be LP Tech Shield. Um, it may be Georgia Pacific Plutonium. It may be Eclipse makes a product. But as long as it blocks 97% of the sun's radiant heat, this is a good thing. You don't have to use this with spray foam. Uh, but where we're doing bat insulation, we're going to be using this no matter what. Um, and then, of course, venting. Now, again, we want your attic, if it's if it's not spray foam, we want that attic to be able to breathe. we got to be able to get air moving through that attic. So we use James Hardy's exclusive ventilated pre-drilled soffit venting combined with ridge venting. And if you look, if you go outside any of our model homes and look up, you can kind of see, if it wants it's spray foam, You'll see a little one inch gap at the top. That's that ridge vent and it allows for passive ventilation. Uh, we really don't like the type of ventilation that requires moving parts um, because moving parts wear out, particularly parts that are exposed to the elements 100% of their lives, which all of these examples are. Even the solar power vents, they're sitting up on top of a shingle roof, it's probably bouncing back heat at 100. 30, 140 degrees, um, anything that requires mechanical moving parts, we want to stay away from. We really want to stick to things that are passive. So air, even a light breeze can move across the top of this house and it will draw air through those soffit vents up and out of that house. Really important that we ventilate. And then R value, so we'll get into that. We've said we use R38 in the attics, R15 in the walls. And it's actually less on spray foam, which kind of boggles people's minds sometimes. But uh, if you got questions about that, feel free to ask. So in climate zone two, we're going to be doing fiberglass bat insulation on the exterior walls and fiberglass blown insulation in the attic, R38 in the attic, R15 in your walls. And then in climate zone three, and also available as an option in climate zone two, is spray foam insulation. And again, the real advantage of spray foam is not the R value. It's actually a lower R value than uh, the batch that we use. You know, getting about an R22 in your attic and an R13 in your exterior walls. But the advantage is it seals up the house completely. Uh, again, you're, you're not losing all that air that you're heating and cooling. That's where spray foam really shines. A um, couple of things that, that are going to be different when we're using spray foam in a home. We're going to be doing, uh, we're not doing soffit vents anymore. We're not doing ridge vents anymore. No radiant barrier. We don't need to insulate the attic stair. Um, and we recommend against the gas appliances, but there's a reason why I'll get to here in a second. But those are, these are all things on the delete list that you don't need if you're doing spray foam. Um, they, there's no benefit to them anymore because you're going to be sealing them up anyway. Must haves. There's a couple of things we do have to go to when we're doing spray foam. If you are going to have gas appliances, we have to uh, change them out to a super high efficiency one. So they have to, because there's nowhere for that gas to dissipate. There's no venting or anything like that. The attic's completely sealed up. So you have to move up to like a 90% efficient uh, water heater. If it's going to be in the space, if it's going to be in the garage, something like that, it's no problem. But this is where, uh, Joe, you're talking about the gas appliances. You know, you may you may have to step up to a, a much higher uh, gas furnace if you do that, and that might push it out of the value savings range. Uh, we, we, of course, we're going to have a dehumidifier on there for sure. We've got to get have a way to get the moisture out of the home because we're not going to have that passive ventilation anymore. You are going to be able to reduce the AC size, which is kind of nice. You're not going to have to move as many cubic feet per minute. 
because you're not going to be losing as much air and um, you won't need to worry about your attic supply and, and return on that. HVAC units, we use a minimum 15 SEER rating on our HVAC systems. Now, what you might find, we do use Linux, what you might find is um, to accomplish that, we we may have to, in some cases, use a 16 SEER equipment or sometimes even larger. Um, because when we say 15 SEER, we want it to be 15 SEER rated where you're feeling it, at the vents. So it works a little bit like horsepower in a car, you know. Uh, horsepower at, at an engine, at the flywheel, is going to be higher than it is before it goes through the transmission, through the drive shaft, through the rear end, through the back axle to the rear wheels. So where you may have 500 horsepower at your engine, you may have 420 horsepower at your rear wheels by the time you lose some of that power going through the various transmissions. HVAC unit is no different. You know, you take a 16 or 17 SEER unit that's on the outside, by the time it moves through the ductwork, the fresh air intake, the dehumidifiers, and all the different things going on, goes through the ductwork and comes out at the vent up in, up in your ceiling, that's where we want it to hit the 15 SEER. So we use a matched system. That's a really big deal because you get a longer warranty. Uh, programmable thermostats are really important. Um, all the ones we use are going to be a Honeywell. They're going to be Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, where you can program them from your phone, um, they can connect to your to your Wi-Fi in your house. You can control them from outside your home. But the biggest thing is being able to control them on the wake away home and sleep settings, so that if you're away at work, they can run up to a different temperature and do all that kind of good stuff automatically. LEDs, we use LED lighting everywhere we possibly can in the house. So that's your recess lights, even the the bulbs that we're putting in. Uh, LED is the most energy efficient right now. Uh, on the market, they use significantly less, 75 to 80 percent less energy than a, a regular incandescent. Um, it's way less heat. You can go grab a, a LED bulb that's going, and it's not going to burn you. I would not tell you to do that with an incandescent. Um, this is a, just a small chart telling you kind of different wattages that are used. So this is your classic kind of 60 watt bulb that you have in a, in a light fixture of old, and that same lighting in an LED would be about 12 watts. So you're, you're pulling about a fifth of the, uh, the amount of energy, which is a really, that's a significant cost saving because lighting accounts for 20 to 30% of your electric bill. Um, so it's still important kids to turn out the lights when you're not in the room, but um, it's not as big a deal as maybe my dad or granddad made about it uh, when we were growing up. Then the other thing to think about is, you know, build a checklist of, of all the various things that are being used and, and, um, Find out if other folks are other folks are using it. You know, I mean, because you, you can throw a lot of money again at, at energy efficiency, um, but it may not be being used in the right way. So you want to use your money as smart as you can. You don't have to spend um, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars um, to make your home energy efficient. You can just make it tight, and that'll accomplish it. So, um, any other questions that anyone has right now, we'll be glad to sit here and answer them. Um, uh, do we have any other? Do we have any other questions, Don? We do have one that has come in. Um, so Chris is asking about our um, our, our insulations. Um, okay, why so why not use that? two to six on exterior and spray foam for added insulation, or would it be an overkill? So um, great question, Chris. Um, so I would say structurally, it's it's overkill. Um, there is you could make a case perhaps if you went to two to six walls on maybe 24 inch centers there'd be a, uh, maybe some cost savings that you could get significantly more insulation um, with that because you're using less wood and you're using more insulation but um, we have found in our calculator we tried about six or eight different things when this, when this whole air changes per hour thing first came out we we did zip wall panels. We did um, Dow blue board foam. We did two by six walls. We did two by four walls. We did spray foam. We did, I mean, we, so we tried, we piloted, you know, we, we asked customer, hey, do you mind if we try this? Do you mind if we try that? Um, all things we knew would work and, and work to code. We wanted to find out which one worked the best for the best value for the, without spending a whole bunch of money for a customer. And the answer is, yeah, you can get more insulation in a two by six cavity. And actually some of the walls are going to be two by six just by virtue of either how tall the plate is, how tall the ceiling is, 
uh, or if they have some type of venting or AC coming up in there. A lot of, a lot of our walls are two by six just by nature of those two things. But from a, from a dollar for dollar standpoint, what we found was the two by four wall using spray foam uh, or two by four wall using an R15 bat was able to meet the air changes per hour, actually exceed the air change per hour requirement and not cost an arm and a leg. The, um, Whereas on the two by six walls, you can do it, but uh, you spend more money. You're not getting, you're not going to get, it'll take you probably longer than your equipment would last to make that money back. If that makes sense. So let's say it's going to take you 17 to 19 years to recoup that cost. Um, you know, it, I, I'm not sure that it then becomes a, a, a good money spending decision, but uh, we do, it's not a whole lot of money to go to two by six walls, but, but I don't, want to sell people on the idea that you're going to save a bunch of money on energy savings because the walls are thicker. Um, back in the day when all you could get was R11 in a two by four wall all day long, I would, I would advise to upgrade to two by six, but now you can get all the way up to R15 in a, in a two by four cavity and you're only going to get an R22 in a two by six cavity. So there's really not, not that much uh, energy. Now, if we were in a super cold climate, that might be a different story, but what we're combating most of the time here where we build in the parts of Texas, we build, we're combating heat, um, not cold. Uh, our value and insulation value like that goes much, much further dollar wise when you're trying to fight against sub freezing temperatures. So your Chicago's, your Milwaukee's, your uh, Denver, Colorado's, those kind of New York, those kind of places. Our value is way more critical in those areas than it is for us. Us, it's all about how do we build the house tight so we're not leaking that cold air that we're paying for out of the home. That's the most important thing. Great question though, Chris. Thank you. Interesting. Um, Kathy has a question about how we finish out our garages. Um, are they insulated in sheetrock? Great question. So, um, yeah, on, on, little over half the houses we build, we have uh, attached garages. And so in that case, yes. So they, the common wall that separates the home from the garage is treated just like a, an exterior wall because it is in fact. So the garage would be non-air conditioned, non-conditioned space. So the wall that's common between the home and the attached garage, that wall would be insulated with, just like if the garage were not there. So that wall will be insulated, um, but the, Exterior walls of the garage itself, nor the attic of the garage itself, would be insulated because you're not you're not conditioning that airspace, so there's nothing really to insulate it against. You can insulate it; it's probably not very much money to do that, uh, but it's not going to make a big uh, impact on on how hot or cold it is inside that home. What's going to make a bigger impact is inside the garage, rather the radiant barrier decking that'll help a whole lot. Or if it's spray foam, that that would be. That would be something that's easier to do. But the garage is going to be sheetrocked, taped, floated, textured, trimmed, and painted, which I, I found in my travels. A lot of builders don't do that. They'll, they'll Most sheet rock builders the do not do that. You get, yeah. you get they'll, sheet, they'll sheet rock and rock tape it. and then have a good day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So attached garages, attached garages, they are sheetrock, taped, floated, textured, trimmed, and painted. So it'll have baseboard, it'll have texture, just like it. Now, a detached garage, that's not the case. On a detached garage, it is going to be exposed studs and rafters unless I think unless it's within three feet of the home, which in that case, why do detach? But if it's within three feet of the home, it has to be sheetrock. That's a, that's a fire code thing. But if it's more than three feet away from the home, a detached garage is going to be exposed studs and rafters unless you wanted it to be sheetrock. Great question, Kathy. Thank you. Great. And Joe has a question about your thoughts on a whole house backup generator. What are my thoughts on a whole house backup generator? Um, well, I have one. <laughs> uh, so I think if you can get a reasonably uh, decent deal on one, maybe maybe do that. Um, I would say ask your neighbors where you're going to move to, how often the power goes out, um, because they're not they're not inexpensive. They're 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 fairly pricey. You're going to spend probably an upwards of of ten to ten to fifteen thousand dollars on a whole house, truly whole house backup generator. And, you know, is the deer meat you got in your freezer worth that? I mean, a, a hunting license is like 63 bucks in Texas. So I'm not, you know, 
it's, it's more of a comfort thing really than it is a, and, and when the power goes out, how long does it go out for? Is it going to be out for days where you can actually stand to lose um, things inside your, your refrigerator and you'd be in a lot of discomfort as it go out for like four hours and then it's back or even six hours and then it's back. So uh, I would find out that first we, we went through a, um, a hurricane, I guess it would have been Ike in 08 in our home. And it was nice to have that, to have, um, now we were only out for probably 24 hours, but it was nice to have, but we, there were many people um, in the Houston area that were out for um, six and eight days. So, you know, you, you don't know until you do. And then when you need one, of course it, it's too late then, but you know, it's certainly something that could be added anytime. You don't have to do it when the house is being built. Um, they're easy, easy, easy to add on later and they don't cost that much more to add them on after the fact. So um, it might be something that you live in for a little bit, then decide, okay, yeah, let's do this. This power is going on all the time. But um, unless the power goes out very frequently for days on end, I mean, it's hard to justify it from a financial standpoint. It's more of just a convenience thing, honestly. That about right, Don? Yeah, that makes sense. You live in a hurricane prone place, so it's, it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're in a hurricane prone place, I, I would say it's, it's invaluable when you need it. <laughs> yeah, I would too. So anyway, any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, guys, you can always reach out to us on our various other channels. We've got a website that's up. Um, we can call any of our design center locations. you got, of course, Instagram, Facebook, our YouTube channel. We, we love to interact with you guys however you want to. We want to be here to help educate you, um, answer all your questions, make the right decision for you and your family. Um, and we genuinely love it when you guys uh, reach out to us and ask us questions. So don't ever, uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out to us and we'd be glad to help. And um, John, I'll make sure that whoever is at your spring location has all the knowledge that they need. Trust me, buddy. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, y'all have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend. Um, support your small family owned businesses. They need your help right now. So uh, do that for the folks that you can to the extent that you can do that and stay safe. They really appreciate it. And um, until next time, we hope to one day make you part of the Tilson family. Y'all have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.